It's World Day against child labor and we're encouraging families and communities to protect the nation's children. Let's all act on the theme and extend social protection to combat child labor. Hello and welcome to Jamaica Magazine. I'm Oroya Eubanks. Our focus on road safety continues on the show today. Road crashes affect our ability to be productive. One crash victim shares her story of trauma and the continuing struggle to cope. Plus, the agriculture sector enabling productivity through creative means. Stay with us. We'll have a full package of news, views, and features starting now. Our men and women. Equality. A message from the Bureau of Gender Affairs and Dispute Resolution Foundation, paid for by the UN Women Fund for Gender Equality. Good day, I'm Andrea Chisholm, and this is your JIS News for Thursday, June 12. Government sent another strong signal this week of its commitment to tackling gun violence. Cabinet made a major move by giving its approval for Jamaica to ratify the United Nations Arms Trade Treaty. Signed last June at the United Nations in New York, the treaty establishes common international standards governing the transfer of conventional weapons, including small arms and light weapons. It must be noted that ratification of the Arms Trade Treaty would assist Jamaica in addressing the challenges related to the inflow of small arms into the country. The intention of the Arms Trade Treaty is to regulate international trade in conventional weapons so as to prevent their diversion from the legal market to the illicit trade. The Information Minister says Cabinet has also approved new legislation to facilitate the establishment of a single designated competent national authority to monitor and keep comprehensive records for small arms in Jamaica. The executive also gave its approval for amendments to the Firearms Act and the Gunpowder and Explosives Act, as well as any other existing legislation to include the relevant provisions necessary for the implementation of the treaty. In the meantime, National Security Minister Peter Bunting will be updating the Jamaican diaspora in the United Kingdom on crime-fighting measures and social intervention programs. Approval was given by Cabinet for the Minister to participate in the fourth biennial Jamaica Diaspora UK National Conference in June and for bilateral meetings in London with government ministers and officials in Birmingham. Government is pushing to pass insolvency legislation in a few months. Finance Minister Dr. Peter Phillips says the bankruptcy bill, which is now before a joint select committee of parliament, will help to boost the development of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs. And will go a far way, I think, to helping reassure uh, small enterprises, micro enterprises, that their need not fear becoming formalized, so to speak, because if you fall upon hard times, it is not the end of the, of the road. Dr. Phillips was speaking at the Fifth Caribbean Microfinance Forum in Montego Bay last week. Government is exploring measures to cut massive telephone bills in the public sector. Technology State Minister Julian Robinson says government will be introducing a system to minimize telecommunication costs through the GovNet infrastructure build-out. We determined that in 2012, government spent approximately $8 million US dollars on government-to-government calls, and for data, an additional $4 million. Just somebody in government calling somebody in government. So we're looking at, for example, a GovTalk system which will eliminate the need for all of these, particularly the cellular calls. Mr. Robinson was making his contribution to the sectoral debate on Wednesday. GovNet seeks to broaden the interconnectivity among all government entities on a shared data platform to become more efficient, productive, transparent and accountable. Government is taking steps to protect Jamaica's most iconic musical creation and ensure that the country and its practitioners reap the greatest returns. The Ministries of Culture, Entertainment and Industry have made a joint submission to have reggae inscribed on the UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. 
For too long we hear that the music sell off, yet in spite of its selling off, we barely seen the profits. Cabinet has affirmed the need to protect Jamaican musical art form and the country's cultural heritage. While making his sectoral presentation, the State Minister for Entertainment said government had also applied for trademark protection of reggae and other authentically Jamaican musical art forms. A national policy will be developed for the protection of reggae, mento, ska, rocksteady and other distinct forms of Jamaican music. Through an artist ambassador program, international fans of Jamaican music practitioners will meanwhile be targeted to stimulate their interest in Jamaica as a tourist destination. And finally, the entertainment state minister said there were plans to utilize the Palisades area as Jamaica's first entertainment zone. He pointed out that the area was already zoned for entertainment, heritage and conservation by the National Environment and Planning Agency. The Tourism and Entertainment Ministry, along with NEPA and the Urban Development Corporation, are now discussing a pilot project to maximize on that designation. In the meantime, work is already underway to facilitate the hosting of entertainment events in designated areas downtown. We are going to be using downtown Kingston, retrofitting the car parks so that they can become now venues because this is a strong commercial area, not disturbed in many places. And we are currently doing noise and sound testing to see which ones are viable as 24-hour zones disturbing no one. And that's it for GIS News Today. Amanda Chisholm, thank you for watching. Increasing productivity and reducing imports, two key goals of the Ministry of Agriculture and critical factors to drive growth and employment. Through initiatives such as the Farmer Exchange Program, Irish potato growers were able to share best practices to improve production. Beneficiaries under the Youth in Agriculture Program rarely saw results. We visited the farms and brought back their stories. Farmers getting to know each other sharing ideas and best practice methods, building a network that will collectively produce to meet local demand and reduce imports. Irish potato accounts for a significant portion of Jamaica's food import bill, and the Ministry of Agriculture is adamant that this must be reduced. To support this, the Youth in Agriculture program funded by the Rural Agricultural Authority, or RADA, has engaged over 200 persons in Irish potato production. Under this program, which now has a women's component, 100 acres have been initially targeted for production. We set out nationally to do about 1,250 hectares of Irish potato between the Geisel area, which includes St. Catherine, St. Anne and St. Mary, and another 600 hectare in the Manchester area. In the interim, targeted farmers have received training, seeds, chemicals, and assistance with land preparation. That land preparation included plowing, rotivating, rowing, molding, trenching. And to get the farmers learning from others in the field, an exchange program was organized by RADA between farmers of Geisel and the Christiana Belt. In March 2014, some of these young farmers from Manchester, St. Elizabeth, Clarendon and Trelawney journeyed to St. Mary and St. Anne to participate in a knowledge sharing exercise. This had them touring other farms to observe operations and best practices from senior farmers in the business. We chose some of the best farmers like Mr. Sital to take other farmers to learn best practices. The farm will get farmers together, so they will be no longer strangers. They'll exchange telephone numbers. They'll be able to talk to each other, replanting material, re-equipment, re-market, re-storage, and deep the whole process of Irish potato culture in Jamaica um, to cut back on the import. The farmers are expected to apply the information they have gathered on their farms for quality yield and increased production. We caught up with a few of them to hear of the experience and the lessons they learned. Well, we spray a potato. We scatter the lyser without blinding it. Get into the program, learn us that we're supposed to blind the lyser before we drop the seed on the land. And a lot of different things, how to use chemicals and how to spray and how often we should spray. I have also learned that after planting, it's best that when you plant the Irish potato, you cover the drills, cover the drills, and then you put your lyser on top so it would just soak down 
on the Irish potato plant itself and then after it grows maybe about six inches or so I would have to re-fertilize again and then I get it mold and continue spraying. They have seen for example um, closer planting distance the farmers in this era they are using up to 20 50 pound bags of small seeds per acre while in Manchester up to recently the farmers were using just 12 bags per acre which give them a smaller plant cone per acre and that was the result at the end of the day with a lower production. So I think the, the whole exchange um, trips will play a dividend in the, the short to medium term. Last year I only did, um, I could only afford to do um, 550 pound bags um, and this year I, through the program I could be able to plant an acre. So it has um, allowed me to expand production. I'm hoping also that we could not only use this approach as part of our teaching approach for farmers that are doing Irish potato, but we could do it for other crops. The Youth in Agriculture program is a grant-funded program costing some $7 million with part sponsorship from local companies. Since 2001, more than 102,000 young persons have been trained and prepared to become leading farmers of tomorrow and key planners in the agriculture sector. And this is one of RADA's efforts to get new people in as a replacement stock for aging farmers and for an employment push for young people who can't find jobs. And the women are right beside them. I want to be one of Jamaica's biggest women farmer. So I got myself involved in this program and I hope as I grow and as I, as I continue to move along with the team, I hope to become better and even better. And with the technology transfer from the Irish Potato Farmers Exchange Program, these farmers will be even more committed to take on the challenge and join the many others who are increasing crop production to meet local demand. And the National Road Maintenance Fund. We turn our focus now to road safety. Data from the National Road Safety Council indicate that between January and the start of June this year, 140 persons were killed on the nation's roads. This is 16 more than the corresponding period last year and 31 more than in 2012. Most of these crashes could have been avoided if road users obeyed the rules of the road. Besides fatalities, collisions cause serious injury, which often leave victims scarred for life. Here now is the story of one such victim. At the time of the crash, Falasha was only 21 years old, a first degree, first year university student. She held a full-time job and was very involved in numerous church, sports and voluntary activities. And without notice, all that changed in an instant. 
it took less than 10 seconds and one driver's misjudgment one driver's decision to speed one driver's choice to be reckless one minute selfish act of dangerous driving and in less than 10 seconds most of my bones were broken my whole being shattered my body wrecked my life mar radically marred and completely changed forever for lasha awoke to find herself in hospital hooked to numerous machines with tubes and needles invading her body her head hands and legs were screwed with nails and supported by metal poles. She was crippled by excruciating pain and no amount of painkillers seemed to give any relief. It was at that point that she wished she had died. Since then, she has undergone 15 major surgeries to bring her body to a point of rehabilitation, including the amputation of her right leg. For the last four years, instead of like my peers pursuing educational, social and economic dreams and goals, I have had to fight and struggle to find recovery where my dreams have been forcibly pushed on a ledge so far from my reach. Because of one driver's choice not to observe road safety, I'm unable to cross the streets or be around moving cars for any amount of time without being overwhelmed by the sense that I'm about to be hit down. I am afflicted with insomnia, panic and anxiety attacks and I'm daily haunted by graphic flashbacks of this accident in my waking hours and in the little sleep I get nightmares. And the pain continues. One driver's choice to disobey road rules has cost for Lasha the loss of family and friends who have found it difficult to come to terms with the sudden transformation of her life. And there's more. I have lost relationships and suffered devastating heartbreaks because these guys could not and eventually refused to deal with or see behind, beyond the destruction of my being and thus walked away. After the accident, I had to drop out of university and to date, it, I have not been able to resume. If it had not been for one driver's choice to be reckless on our roads, Falasha would have graduated in July 2012. And instead of having a student loan debt, she has incurred hospital expenses of more than $5 million and growing, and has to find over $30,000 monthly for medication, crippling her personal savings and dashing her hopes of finding employment. Because of one driver's choice, to not observe road safety. Whenever I apply for a job, my visual damages are what are seen and my credits, qualifications, takes back page. And they create an endless list of cans and render me disabled and incapable without a chance, making it manifold times harder in a job market that is already very overpopulated. Time won't allow me to even begin to list and dissect for you the countless ways in which this accident has affected my life and continues to wreak havoc in my body. Just imagine with me for one minute. You're in constant, horrendous pain. Moving around on one leg that has a broken knee using an arm with a broken shoulder that is protruding through the skin. <coughs> that your leg has been amputated in a society that removes the disc from disability and placed on there, thus rendering the disabled unable. Where every single day, everywhere you go, people stare at you like you just fell from Mars where hardly anyone sees or treats you as a wholesome person with wholesome brain, emotions and feelings. And when persons look at you, they no longer see you, but see an amputation and thus look at you and make comments laced with pity, smirks, condemnation, mockery, and for some, even scorn. That you are no longer looked at as a rightful contributing member of society but as a liability who is barely tolerated. There are no words to adequately express 
to you all that one driver's disregard for road safety has done and continues to do with my life. I stand here today only because of the grace and goodness of God. And I am begging you, please do not be the next driver to disregard road safety and shatter another person's life. Don't be the next driver to true irresponsible and dangerous driving. Choose to destroy another life. The World Cup got off to a great start today and football fans were glued to their TVs to watch. All the matches will be carried live and though they're being played in Brazil, we can stay right here in Jamaica and watch in the comfort of our living rooms. Ever wonder how this is possible? Find out in this next feature. In the late 1800s, a 23-year-old German student, Paul Nipkow, succeeded in sending images to wires with the help of a rotating disc. He had invented the first ever mechanical module of television using a technology called the electric telescope. Other inventors after him perfected the craft by using the cathode ray tube and mechanical scanner system to create a new television system. And so, what was once a manually operated machine that only gave black and white pictures is now a more sophisticated, modern electronic machine operated by the press of a button. The television creates moving pictures by repeatedly capturing still pictures and presenting these frames to our eyes so quickly that they seem to be moving. The TV set receives these pictures along with sound as electronic signals sent from broadcast houses or TV stations as we call them. The signals go through the tuner or antenna socket. Now in the TV you have the demodulator circuit. That now separates the video from the audio. The video information is sent to the CRT while the audio is sent to the audio processor in order for us to get sound. The CRT, or cathode ray tube, is often referred to as the picture tube, and elements inside it begin to reconstruct the pictures almost immediately. From this point, the picture signal goes to the electron gun circuit, which splits the video into separate red, blue, and green beams to drive the three electron guns. Attached to the gun, the all-important flyback. This flyback supply the high voltage. Now this high voltage is used to light up the CRT. And once the CRT comes alive, it emits the red, blue and green electron beams which will scan the pictures. The scanning is done from right to left all the way to the bottom of the TV screen and restarts at the top. The colored beams pass through a grid of holes called a shadow mask which directs them so they hit exact places on the screen. Now, you also need the horizontal yoke. Now, this yoke is what is used to direct the beams so that each beam is focused to that particular pixel. So that all the beams enter the shadow mass through one hole. Right? That way we can get a true white picture. You also have the magnet here, which is used to align the beam so that they are perfect, spot on. Inside these tiny holes are phosphor-coated color dots, which when they're hit by the beams, quickly build up a colored picture, while elsewhere on the screen remains dark. Spots of light are also produced on the screen by the transfer of the CRT beam energy to the phosphor. That is what allows us to see the light, the ultraviolet ray is really invisible to the human eye. So the phosphor, phosphor is what create that 
bright light so you can actually see the picture. So what we see on our screen is the combined effect of all the electron light emissions. Everything happens so fast that it almost seems instant. But the reality is that the electron beams actually scan a pixel mask of 525 lines 30 times per second. This is what creates the illusion of moving pictures. While all this is happening, audio information from the incoming signal passes through a separate audio circuit, which drives it to the loudspeaker so they can recreate the sound exactly in time with the moving picture. So in a nutshell, the signal from a broadcast house goes to your TV tuner or antenna socket, then to the signal processor which separates the audio from the video. The video signal is then fed to the cathode ray tube while the audio signal enters a separate circuit and both go through a quick but complex process to produce picture and sound. Pleasant viewing. There's a concert today. Come along, there's a concert here today. So take your seat and put your best. Hurricanes can strike at any time. In the event of one, be prepared to act quickly. If a hurricane watch or warning has been issued, review your home disaster response plan. Map out likely routes to evacuate if your home is at risk and confirm with relatives or friends you plan to stay with. Also, confirm the location of the nearest shelter. Check your emergency supplies and restock if necessary. Remember, disasters do happen, so be prepared. Child labor robs our children of a good quality of life. It often affects their education and can even put them in harm's way. Today is World Day Against Child Labor, and we went out a road to ask, how can we protect our children against child labor? Be more responsible parents, because you're, you're done a parent already. Why are you going to send a child out there for going to work? You be more responsible. You're the parent. And when they find a child that is working and find out his parents, them, them lock up the parents, them, and them for go work for them picnic. You know, you bring picnic for come work for you, you work for your child. Take care of them. Like and that them from go out on the street and do what they are not supposed to do. Well, my views are to make sure your children they know where they are at night, especially. Require the use of an ID. Like, persons over 18 or over 21 alone should be applicable for the job. When you have a child, people have just take care of your child. And be a man and be a mother. Proper parenting and plan for our children. Stop having too many children and be prepared for when your children come so that they don't have to be put out there to face what it is that adults should be facing as children. The show has come to an end, but the information continues to flow on our website, jis.gov.jm. And while you're on the web, send your ideas and comments via Twitter at JIS News or email jamaicamagazine at jis.gov.jm. Until tomorrow when we do it all over again, I am Arroyo Eubanks on behalf of the production crew saying what good. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.